Uh, friends, we are starting now. This is uh, today's 173 Friday group meeting. Uh, the topic is constitutional transformation, uh, silences of the constitution. The speaker is our uh, beloved senior advocate, Mr. Shekhar Navde, one of the topmost uh, senior advocate and the constitutional experts. Sir, also addressed our Friday group uh, on 23rd March 2018. Uh, that is 75th millennium something like it, sir. Platinum you address, sir. And second you address on 28th February 2020, that is part one. Okay. Impact of the Constitution on Criminal Law, part two, 6th March 2020. So, your contribution for Friday Group viewership, sir, uh, 40,000. 20,000 on Land Acquisition Act, first one. And 10, 10,000 this is out of. Uh, 10,76,000 we have viewers. <coughs> Your contribution is uh, 40,000, sir. We are all grateful. Please, uh, let's start. One second, sir. This group <coughs> is doing a great job. And the entire credit goes to Mr. Rahman. Let me at the outset say that it's an honor and privilege to interact with your peers, professional peers. I'm not a jurist. I have no pretensions of having understood the constitutional philosophy. <coughs> but whatever bit that I have learned, I want to share it with you. Let me at the outset inform you that this one lecture would not be enough. Maybe at some appropriate time, we may have a second one. But the, the scope of this subject is very vast. There are two main <coughs> topics. One is transformation of the constitution. And the second is the silence of the constitution. Let me introduce these two concepts to you first. Silence of the Constitution means that the Constitution speaks to you in whispers or sometimes in a very loud tone. Now take for example the basic structure doctrine. Where do we get in the Constitution? If you read from Article 1 to the last article, there is no reference to basic structure. But the constitution does tell you that there is something which is called basic structure. How we came to that conclusion, we will see in the course of discussion. <coughs> now, constitutional transformation. What do I mean by that? See, take human body. The way I look today and the way I looked when I took birth, there is a vast difference. If you see your own photographs, you perhaps may not be able to recognize your own photograph when you are a, an infant because so many changes have taken place in your body. Every day some changes are taking. The constitution also, like human body, is evolving, constantly undergoing a change. Every change is not constitutional transformation. Constitutional transformation means that something radical has happened and there is a significant impact on what we understand 
the constitution or its provisions. Now our journey begins in 1950 itself. Two important judgments. One, A.K. Gopalan versus State of Madras. What was the issue? There was a challenge to the constitutional validity of the law which provided for preventive detention. Two contentions were raised in A.K. Gopalan's case. Significant contentions. There were other incidental with which we are not widely concerned. Contention number one was that Article 22, which provides for preventive detention, must be read with other fundamental rights. 191A, 191C, 191D, movement throughout the territory of India, etc. So therefore, any law which provides for preventive detention must be tested on the principle of reasonableness, which is contemplated by clauses 2 to 6 of Article 19. You can't read Article 22 in isolation. It must be read with other fundamental rights. Supreme Court negated that. And said no. Article 22 is a self-contained court and it need not be read with other fundamental rights. Is this a silence of the constitution or a transformation? We will see that. A silence is also can lead to transformation, constitutional transformation. The distinction between the two is very thin and subtle. What was the other contention? The other contention was Article 21 also must be read with 22. That is, 21 says no one shall be deprived of his life and liberty except by procedure established by law. Nambiar's argument was that the law must be reasonable. <coughs> Implicit in Article 21 is the mandate of the Constitution that the law which deprives you of your liberty by enacting a preventive intention law must be reasonable. <coughs> Supreme Court negated that. They said no. Whether the law should be reasonable or not is not within the ambit of the court's power. If there is law which takes away your liberty, you are detailed, it is not for the court to inquire into the reasonableness of the law. So I ask myself a very simple question. Suppose somebody commits a theft of 100 rupees, you sentence him to death by law? I am deliberately taking an extreme example then Article 21 has no meaning as a fundamental right. There is a dissenting judgment. See, I always believe whether in the life of a nation, whether a political idea or a idea which deals with law or the constitution, an idea is a force. A much more powerful force than any of the natural forces that we have. It was Justice Fazal Ali who delivered a dissenting judgment. And that dissenting judgment has become the law now, after so many years. We will briefly trace that out. Justice Fazal Ali said that implicit in Article 21 is due process. And what does due process mean? That the law which deprives you of your liberty must be tested on the touchstone of reasonableness. Okay. We'll see what happened to these to these two principles. There was another argument which was advanced. There are two clauses important in Article 22. If you have the constitution, please open. Article 22.4, 
and Article 22.7, that is Clause 4 and Clause 7. Article 22, Clause 4 lays down that if there is a law which deals with preventive detention, then such a law must provide for a reference to the advisory board in case the detention is to exceed three months. In other words, the law must necessarily provide for reference to advisory board if the detention is to be beyond the period of two years. Clause 7 lays down that the parliament may by law in classes of cases dispense with reference to the advisory board. Now, such a law can be made only by parliament. The state legislatures cannot make such a law. They can make a law which provides for reference to advisory board. The question before the court was that whether clause 7 is an exception and clause 4 is the rule. In other words, when the parliament provides for dispensation with the advisory board, the parliament, the law must make out the case. That in every case you cannot dispense with the advisory board. So there must be exceptional cases. Majority judgment rejects this contention. They say no. It's an alternative source. The parliament may enact under 22.4 or parliament may enact under 22.7. Again, Justice Fadalali's judgment is dissenting. He says no. Clause 7 gives extraordinary powers to the parliament and therefore they must be considered as an exception and the law must make out a case otherwise the law would 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 be arbitrary and it would be hit by the vice of unreasonableness and the courts can strike it so this is how we began the first judgment now the interpretation of Article 22 in the light of 21, Article 22 in the light of 19 and other articles, the Constitution doesn't say anything. Does it say that you must read all these articles together? Does it say that 22 is a self-contained code? Does it say that 21 must test the law must? These are all silences of the Constitution. But they do whisper. The Constitution does whisper. Now what happened subsequently? We will first go to 73. Shambhunath Sarkar versus. But before that, we have R.C. Cooper versus Union of India, 1970. This was a case of bank nationalization. <coughs> and the question before the court was that Article 31, which then provided for acquisition of property of a citizen, <coughs> Whether such a law must be read with Article 191F. Article 191F then was a fundamental right relating to property. And whether it should be read with 14, whether it should be read with other articles, that is 191G, to carry on business, fundamental right, to hold property, 191F, fundamental right. Article 14, no discrimination. In R.C. Cooper, by a larger bench, the Supreme Court came to the conclusion that all these fundamental rights must be read together. You can't read them in isolation. Therefore, 31 must be read with 191G, 191F, 14, etc. And therefore, the law must be tested on the touchstone of reasonableness. So, it was the first blow to the A.K. <coughs> Gopalan. Since it was a property right, the court had no occasion to consider the interpretation in Gopalan's case of 22.4 and 22.7. That came soon after, that is Shambhuna Sarkar versus State of West Bengal, 73 judgment. There, if you read Justice Chandrachuk's judgment, the senior Chandrachu, 
It's an excellent piece of literature. And his lordship says that our interpretation in Gopalan's case has led to evil consequences. These are the words. That the parliament is, is now showing a tendency to enact very arbitrary laws. This has to be stopped. Therefore, in Shambhunath Sarkar, the court said that 20 to 4 is the rule. And therefore, you must provide for advisory board, reference to advisory board, in case the detention is to exceed three months. And only in exceptional cases that you can dispense with reference to advisory board, but the law must make out a case. Why? So, burden is on the parliament. This is a... Do you think this is constitutional transformation? Do you also <coughs> think this is silence? Now, earlier it was a whisper for Justice Fadal Ali. It became a loud message to their lordships, both in R.C. Cooper as well as in Shamunan Sarkar. Okay. Soon thereafter, we have E.P. Royappa case, 1974. E.P. Royappa is a turning point. I would say that. R.C. Cooper, Shabunath Sarkar, of course they are very significant judgments and they do start the process of transformation. But it is E.P. Royappa's case, 1974, for the first time the Supreme Court says that forget classification theory. Earlier what was the view? That Article 14 <coughs> test can be passed if the law provides for intelligible differentia, classification is based on an intelligible differentia, having a rational nexus to the object of legislation, three things, classification, intelligible differentia, third, rational nexus to the object of legislation, Article 14 test is passed. So the whole doctrine related to classification. But in the Royappa's case, Supreme Court said no. In addition to classification, doctrine of reasonableness, forget classification, if the law in its intrinsically is unreasonable, is intrinsically arbitrary, if there is inherent power which can be abused, such a law has to be struck down under 14. This is real constitutional transformation. Now the constitution is talking, has started talking to us in very loud voice. That was 74. And then comes Manika Gandhi in 78. <coughs> Manika Gandhi is a, is a milestone what has the Supreme Court said? Supreme Court has endorsed what was caught by Justice Fazal Ali. Justice Fazal Ali planted the seed. Now the tree is growing. And they said that any law which deprives you of your liberty must be reasonable. And this is implicit in Article 21. Now you saw the doctrine of reasonableness. There are two distinct streams which merge into a big river. Article 14, Article 21. You see, this is this is a significant. The two streams, it's a uh, what do we call <coughs> Sangam, which is brought about by, and I always say, an idea is a force. It was started by Justice Fazal Ali. All right, <coughs> this is one stream. Now let's look at something else. We saw the stirrings of the constitution. Earlier it was very quiet. 
now the constitution started speaking in louder and louder of course only to those who had who were not deaf some are deaf you can't help it now i go back to again 1950 it is you see a no development no social development no cultural development no economic development no development of any thoughts no development of constitution or evolution of a any legal structure can be linear see it was only marx who said that from a primitive communism you go to feudalism from feudalism you go to capitalism and from capitalism you go to higher forms of communism it doesn't happen in life there is no linear development it is always like a climbing a, a grease pole you go up you come down you go up you come down now let's see what is happening in other areas of the constitution and these are rare relevant issues from what happened yesterday in delhi airport so the the debate on ak gopalan is still not over it is very much live now we deal with a very important topic <coughs> that is the parliament's power to amend the constitution the debate has again started why this is happening i gave you an example our body also undergoes similarly any association any human society under the king it is it is in the it's a natural thing <coughs> now in kameshwar singh versus state of bihar the patna high court struck down the <coughs> bihar land reform act on the ground that it violates article 14 etc because the there was a discriminatory provision for payment of compensation we need not go deep into its details now the state of bihar filed an appeal <coughs> during the pendency of the appeal the first amendment came to the constitution and it's a disaster but before that can constitution be amended change answer is of course yes why this is so a bit of philosophical approach is warranted see there are three types of sovereignties first every, every citizen when is born is oh god i forgot to yeah. sorry it's okay if there are three types of sovereignty the nature makes everyone a citizen if sovereign but if you have 100 crore population <coughs> everyone can't be sovereign then we will go back to the jungle branch so okay so therefore i have to part with my sovereignty and accept certain discipline to live in an organized society so that is popular sovereignty i'll give you an illustration the british ruled over us for 150 years we had a freedom movement which led to the liberation the british rule established through various laws par passed by the british parliament including the last one government of india act 1935 that was the legal sovereign if you remember the queen's proclamation of 1858 she took over the reins of administration in india because she became the legal sovereign 
the freedom movement was a reflection of the sovereign people wanted to liberate themselves in other words the legal sovereign versus political sovereign which led to emergence of a new sovereign so that is popular sovereignty <coughs> the constitution was being framed how does the constitution begin with the frame we the people of india i was not there what is this we the people my great grandfather was there my grandfather was there my father was there i was not there so what is this we the people therefore am i a party to this we the people no does that mean that i am not bound by it of course i am bound by it but this expression we the people means the generations to come also and therefore my father my grandfather was a party to framing of this i was not but therefore i must have an opportunity isn't it therefore we the people is means the continuous mass of people who continue to come in the years thereafter so therefore we the people therefore have a right to change the constitution that's the simple logic as i see it but what do we do with changes in the constitution we fundamentally change its structure we make some small changes instead of window here you close it there and you open it there or you demolish this whole structure and these are matters of debate that's where we go we saw from popular sovereignty we went to constitutional sovereignty now the constitution is the sovereign because all organs of the state judiciary legislature executive they derive their powers from the constitution correct therefore constitution is sovereign but we the people are we have retained a part of our popular sovereignty and how do we express how popular sovereignty enforces its rights because 120 crores people can't go and say we are sovereign we are changing the constitution it's not possible it will lead to anarchy so therefore we must have a mechanism and that mechanism is we have the legislature now the legislature has two facets one as the law maker that is legislature as an organ of the state which derives its authority from the constitution and we are legislature which says that i can change my maker <coughs> who is my maker the constitution and where do you get it i get it in 368 that is we the people if we don't want a constitutional amendment the political sovereign will assert itself some form or the other we saw that in emergency so it's not that the concept of political sovereignty is still live in fact this is unfortunately not discussed either in keshavanand bharti or any of the judgment that article 368 is a reflection of the political sovereignty but channelized through a constitutional machinery but if the parliament tends to abuse its power <coughs> then what happens you saw that during emergency in this context i am reminded of the great indian mahatma gandhi it's a very difficult to understand this man i have made several attempts sometimes i think i understand him sometimes i feel no it's difficult but there is one significant sentence which he has said his whole concept of satyagraha is based on a moral law 
He says apart from the state law, there is a higher law that is your conscience. The call of the constitution, the call of the conscience, he says, is my law. And therefore, there is no obligation on me to obey a law which I consider as unjust. And therefore, I defy that law. But he says, if everybody starts doing it, there will be anarchy. I should be ready to face the consequences. And therefore, when I defy the law, I am willing to go to jail and accept the punishment. But I do assert my political sovereignty. So throughout the world, you will find that this is always so. Constitutional sovereignty versus the popular sovereignty. And this is, this struggle will go on. As long as, because we human beings can't be perfect. So this is the measure of imperfection and therefore uh, the intensity of this struggle will change. <coughs> but it will remain for all time to come. <coughs> so, from political sovereignty, we went to constitutional sovereignty. And then we have parliamentary sovereignty. What does it mean that the parliament has, make, has a right to make a law? Which the judiciary must respect. Unless the judiciary finds that the parliament has crossed the Lakshman Rekha, then we come to judicial sovereignty. This is hardly discussed. In my view, there is a concept of judicial sovereignty. The power of judicial review is nothing but judicial sovereignty. What is the criticism of the executive and the parliament today? That we are elected by the people, we the people, and therefore we have a right to change the constitution the way we like. The judicial sovereignty says, no sir, the constitution has also conferred judicial sovereignty on us because the judicial review is a part of basic structure. And we are the conscience keepers. And therefore, whether you transgress the constitutional limits or not is for us to also to decide. Now, this is a turf conflict. Bound to happen if two neighbors boundary dispute. <laughs> my body, my property is up to this point. He says, no, no, it is up to this point. So, it's a turf. The judicial sovereignty versus parliamentary sovereignty. This is inevitable. I will give you a small example because this subject is so vast. But I want to crystallize it in some form of proposition. See, under the constitution, a president is a part of parliament. The similarly, governor is a part of the state legislature. The parliament may pass, but unless the president gives assent, it is never wrong. A bill which is not assented by the president can never become law. Now, right now, we have tougher uh, uh, this uh, war going on between West Bengal on the one hand and Delhi on the other. Then Tamil Nadu is also complaining. So many other states are complaining. Our <laughs> legislative assemblies are passing laws. Governors are not giving assent. Now see, one instance, when Gyanis Singh sing was the president of India, he was not a very highly sophisticated man, he was a rustic Punjabi, but a tremendous horses. And uh, there were attempts to ridicule him. There was one postal bill, I don't know how many of you remember that, perhaps some of you were maybe in schools except the old generation that I see. And it contained draconian provisions. Gyanis Ben Singh said, how can parliament pass such a law? It was the Congress government, right? Mm -hmm. Look, the conscience keepers. He said, let me study. The constitution <coughs> does not say within what time the president should give his assent. There is a silence of the constitution. 
Now you have same problem here. Collegium recommends within what time <laughs> government should be. So these are silences of the constitution which create lot of problems. Sometimes they smooth them out, sometimes they create problems. He said, sorry, let me study. So he kept pending it. In the meanwhile, the public debate started. Whether this kind of draconian power should be given to the postal authorities to open anybody's letter to anybody's package. See, there was some, some similar law in 1931 enacted by the British to control the Swadeshi movement in India. So, Gyanis Sahib ne kaha ki bhai nahi, mai to sochun ka pura is. And he kept the bill pending. Matter went in the court of people. People started agitating. Mr. Rajiv Gandhi realized ki ye bhaut bhaari pad jayega. Let us drop the idea. And that bill, till date has remained a bill. No subsequent sub president of India has ever thought of giving us. So, you saw popular sovereignty. Constitutional sovereignty, the role of the president is not a rubber stamp. Silence of the constitution. Anyway, we will come back to what happened after Kamishwar. Nehru was a great socialist and a very towering personality. The, there was hardly any difference between parliament and executive. Whatever Nehru sahab said was the law. So he said, what is this? These feudal lords are challenging the socialist law that we are enacting to bring about agricultural reforms. So, the first amendment to the constitution, Article 31A, 31B, 9th Schedule. And what is the purpose of these articles? That this law for agrarian reforms, which will affect your fundamental rights cannot be questioned. So every single statute which was kept in the ninth schedule became immune from challenge on any of the fundamental rights. This amendment itself was challenged and that is Shankar Prasad Singh Dev was his leader. It's a great blow. I don't say it's a constitutional transformation. I say it's a substantial damage to the constitution. Supreme Court said that the constitution is amended in exercise of Article 368, which is the constituent power. And therefore, it is not law within the meaning of Article 13. And therefore, parliament can make any law and bring about a change in the constitution and courts can't examine it. Constituent power, it's not a law within the meaning of Article 31 and therefore any constitutional amendment cannot be examined, its virus cannot be examined by the courts. <coughs> now I ask myself, to take away 191A, 191B, C, D, E, F, G, what? Are clauses 2 to 6 tell you that all these fundamental rights can be regulated by reasonable restrictions? Okay. Now the parliament says, no, 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 we don't want this reasonableness. We want to destroy. In other words, why do I say it's a blow to the constitution? Because the Supreme Court accepts that the law can be unreasonable. <coughs> And the parliament has the right to make an unreasonable law. That takes me to the basic concept of rule of law. If you see the concept of rule of law which evolved over centuries in the commonwealth countries from which we got it by way of Virasat, inheritance. The whole concept of rule of law is based on reasonableness. If somebody commits a theft of a small item, you cut off his hands. Ask any, that is the measure of civilization, that the one who commits, in, commits an offense, the, there has to be proportionality. A person who, who commits 
मिसाप्रोपर्टी टेन रुपीस यू शूट हिम नाउ देर फॉर दिस होल थीसिस परगेट कॉन्स्टिट्यूएंट पावर वेदर इट्स अ लॉ नॉट लॉ पार्लियामेंट पावर परगेट हाउ कैन यू हाउ कैन जुडिशरी एवर एक्सेप्ट दैट द पार्लियामेंट कैन मेक एन अनरिजनेबल लॉ एंड यू विल से सॉरी वी आर नो पावर एंड ऑफ रूल ऑफ लॉ एंड ऑफ सिविलाइजेशन and these are not fanciful thoughts we saw that those of us who lived through those 19 days of emergency we know what happened in this country and we also apprehend that it may happen now so it is not a case of fox is coming is there very much around the wolf is always around remember that so therefore this is a first major blow to the constitutional structure that the parliament can make a law which is unreasonable this is not merely constitutional transformation but its defacement but anyone who talks is you are a capitalist <coughs> never get carried away by this if i have to express myself 1918 eh? 1918 how do i communicate with you tomorrow i said that mr apde sorry we will not permit you to use mobile sorry mr apde we will not allow you to publish pamphlets sorry mr apde we will not allow you to publish books and distribute or issue newspapers 1918 but for that also i require some measure of property somewhere no and this is what justice fazlalli said this is what in rc cooper they said that these are all interconnected you take away one fundamental right the other fundamental rights will become zero 191c how does popular sovereignty exercise its power right of demonstration you say no 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 you can't demo you can't come on the public 191c is gone so the point is that the supreme court went to the extreme that this parliament can make a law all right this is 51 but you will always remember <coughs> that judiciary all over the world is such an institution <coughs> that it has inherent capacity to correct itself because what is the essence of judicial adjudication it's a clash of ideas and i have said that idea is a force for some ideas to gather momentum takes some time some a small stream starts on some top of the hill and then it becomes in course of time a kaveri a almost a sea like river so the idea started gathering momentum and the first impact of these ideas comes from pakistan can you believe this we owe the theory of basic structure to pakistan which has never seen a constitutional governance in its last 70 years of its 75 years of its existence it was justice mudolkar who noticed in judgment of the pakistani supreme court it's a reported judgment in that pakistani journal i'll tell you the name of the case also it is uh this put my glasses it's a very important judgment all of you should read it that we have lot to learn from your pakistan <coughs> this is uh Fazal Chaudhary versus Muhammad Abdul, 1963 PLD, 486. It is Pakistan Supreme Court which dealt with an amendment to Pakistani Constitution. It said that you can't change the basic structure. This judgment was picked up by Justice Mudarkar in year 1965. Sajjan Singh versus State of Rajasthan. 
I will tell you the citation and please read this judgment that is a 65 Supreme Court AIR page 845 and in paragraph 59 of that judgment you will find Justice Mudarkar quotes this Pakistani judgment. Therefore, Mudarkar expresses a doubt <coughs> whether this constituent power and a power to amend any part of the constitution destroy, defense, since he says doubtful. <coughs> The other judge, Justice Hidayatullah also joined that and says that this requires reconsideration. Kameshwar, uh, sorry, Shantir Prasad requires reconsideration. This was 65. So this is the capacity of the judiciary to correct itself. And this idea gathered momentum and soon we see its impact in Goraknath versus State of Punjab, 67 they said now, thus far and no further. You have damaged the fundamental rights, you have caused. There at that time basic structure doctrine was not picked up by the Supreme Court in Golaknath. But if you see the discussion without specifically referring to the basic structure doctrine, you will find that there is a discussion about it. And it's a, a wafer thin majority. The Supreme Court says that you can't touch the fundamental rights. And it comes with a, a new doctrine of prospective overruling, a constitutional transformation. That so far you have violated fundamental rights, you have put number of statutes in the ninth schedule which are immune from any challenge on the basis of violation of fundamental rights. It's all right. You ho gaya, wo ho gaya. But not hereafter. Constitutional prohibition to touch the fundamental rights, two things came, <coughs> prospective overruling, whatever that has happened has happened, we can't unravel that, but hereafter you shall not do it. Supreme Court went to other extreme. So from Mr. Rao to this my friend, now in between I come, they, then they realized that uh, this may create a lot of problems for implementing socio-economic reforms. I don't know whether they really come, but uh, this is the popular belief. And then comes Keshwar Nandala, 1973. <laughs> and it is in Keshwar Nandala that we get this doctrine of basic structure. Now, this is a silence of the constitution. This doctrine evolved when the constitution started talking to you that look here, I can be changed but not so as to wipe out my identity altogether. Some part of my identity must remain. But what is that basic structure? There are 11 judgments. It's a bench of 13 judges. There are 11 judgments. And difficult to find out the ratio. I have made honest attempts and I must acknowledge publicly that I have not been able to. I have got some, some understanding that they say that, that social, uh, this secularism is a basic structure, democracy is a structure. But it's not clear. Now, democracy means what? Majoritarian rule? My concept of democracy is that judicial review is a part of democracy. Rights of minorities is a part of judicial, uh, is a part of democracy. According to me, democracy doesn't mean that I got majority in parliament, therefore I can do anything. So, very concept of democracy is not crystallized. Now, forget everything. Whether Article 14, as interpreted in the Roy Appa's case, that reasonableness, is it a part of the basic structure or not? See, out of 13 judges, 9 have signed a summary. 4 judges have not signed a summary. You will get the summary in SCR report. You won't get it in SCR. But that has no meaning because all judges have not signed. 
so today we are all we are like uh, those four or five blind men somebody says this is elephant somebody says that is elephant so the judiciary is no exception to that each judgment says no this is basic stuff take a case of article 14 which according to me is the soul of the constitution as interpreted in the royal court or article 21 <coughs> as interpreted by fazal ali as understood in manika gandhi's case soul of the constitution you can't make an unreasonable law to deprive a city can you have a law that without a trial man can be kept in jail for for his biological life <laughs> if you strictly go by gopalan there is a law how can court examine the reasonable see these are serious questions these are not merely for the lawyers <coughs> to debate in a library these are live issues outside so the point is that even judges do not say all the judges do not say that article 14 is a part of the basic So from now we have started interpreting what is basic stuff. Okay. Now let's see after uh, no. Keshwanand Bharti. You have two important judges, Minarwani and Vamandra. Now what was the issue in? There were number of issues. but right now we are concerned with the parliament's power to amend it but i forgot to tell you that one of the reasons which has disturbed me as far as uh, shankar prasad is concerned see <laughs> rajya sabha was not there in 1951 the original constituent assembly became a parliament there was no rajya sabha because the first general election took place in 1952 now how can you have an amendment to the constitution without the other half of the parliament not being there this is a serious issue the parliament means both lok sabha and rajya sabha and therefore article 368 must mean both lok sabha and rajya sabha otherwise if you say only lok sabha today they can pass any law anyway this is something which i had forgot to to tell you now comes miller wami what was the issue in that 42nd amendment see what was the issue in 42nd amendment let's go to 368 clause 4 and 5 the parliament attempted to get over the basic structure doctrine also attempted to get over the power of judicial review vested with the court i will tell you what article 368 4 lays down it's very interesting and the danger has not yet gone because now somebody in the authority is talking about it day in and day out <coughs> this is the amendment no amendment of the constitution including provisions of part 3 that is fundamental rights made or purported to have been made under article this article means 368 whether before or after the commencement of section 55 that is the <coughs> amending section that is 42nd amendment shall be called in question in any court on any ground so no judicial review of any amendment to the constitution clause 5 for the removal of doubts it is hereby declared that there shall be no limitation whatever 
on the constituent power of the parliament to amend by way of addition, variation, repeal of the provisions of the constitution. These amendments, fortunately for us, they struck down in Minerva case, 1980. Please read the judgment of Justice Chandrasekhar. If these amendments had survived, I don't know. I wouldn't have been here at this, 100 percent. Now then came Vaman Rao. The part of 31C was struck down. Actually, Vaman Rao and uh, Minerva Mill are almost contemporaneous. Maybe a few months difference here and there. Now what they wanted to do with 31C, the parliament is very clever consists of very clever people. They know how to take the people for a ride. And some of us did go for a ride, willingly. That's the unfortunate part. See, they, what they wanted to do with 31. Notwithstanding anything contained in Article 13, that is, which defines law, no law giving effect to the policy of the state towards securing all or any of the principles laid down in Part 4 shall be deemed to be void on the ground that it is inconsistent with or takes away or abridges any of the rights conferred by Article 14 or 19. Now, not only the constitutional amendment, but any law. So, by simple law, your rights under 1419 can be taken away. And no law containing a declaration that it is for giving effect to such policy shall be called in any question in any court on the ground whatsoever. So, once the parliament says that this is to give effect to part 4, End of the matter, courts can't examine. Fortunately, this was struck down in Vavandra's case. So, Minerva Mill, Vavandra are significant. Now, you see, each one of these judgments is a matter of one class. But I just want to give you the important points. Because these are important constitutional issues. Now comes <coughs> in Vamandra a very significant statement is made. What should say that in certain cases even a curtailment of a fundamental right, mark this word, a curtailment of fundamental right, not abrogation, may affect the basic structure. So this notion that only the constitutional amendment, <coughs> but even a law can affect the basic structure and the courts can declare it. <coughs> but they also hasten to add. <coughs> that in certain given cases <coughs> that a total abrogation of fundamental rights may not affect the basic structure. Goes back to uh, Shankar Prasad. But in a given case. So in other words, what is that given case? Who will decide? The judiciary has kept that power. So the point is that there has been a significant dent on the doctrine of absolute sovereignty propounded in Shankar Prasad, parliamentary, absolute parliamentary sovereignty is substantially dented by Keshwananda Bharti, by Minerva Min, by Vamandrao. Now comes the iron Koilo. Now Koilo it is still widened. The Koilo is 2007. So the you'll find that judicial thinking 
is now stabilizing. Shankar Prasad, Kolaknath. Now the pendulum is oscillating sometimes here, sometimes there. <clears throat> Within reasonable bounds. It's not taking quantum jumps this way or that way. So now the accepted position is that a constitutional amendment is not a law for the purpose of Article 13. So therefore, Golaknath is buried. Golaknath said that even an amendment of the constitution is a law within the meaning of Article 13. And therefore, if it touches, curtails fundamental rights, it is void. Now, that doctrine is rejected. Now, we recognize that it is not a law for the purpose of 13. So, the, now the Lordship say that in a given case, even complete abrogation may not touch the basic structure. But in a given case, even slight curtailment may affect the basic structure. So, this is how the constitutional transformation or silences of the constitution are progressing. Now, the last point which I want to make, which is a hot topic, and I was a bit reluctant to talk on that subject. But uh, I feel uh, compelled to say so something. Else. And my views may not be popular. See the current debate that is going on between the executive and the judiciary about collegium system. According to me, those three cases, S.P. Gupta, Advocates Association, uh, Awards Association versus Union of India and the Special Reference. That is 1982, 96 and 98. If you look at Article 124, by these three judgments, the Supreme Court has turned Article 124 upside down. Completely upside down. Making appointments is not the function of the judiciary. It's an administrative function, rightly belongs to the realm of the executive. And all that is required is, if you look at Article 124, the president shall, in consultation with, now what is? The collegium shall, in consultation, that means the executive cannot appoint anyone who is not recommended. Where do you get this? And this is in the name of independence of the judiciary. I join serious issue on this. Independence of the judiciary does not depend upon who is your appointing authority. Are you true to the oath that you take that you will administer justice without fear and favor? If you do that, no one can touch you. You must have confidence in yourself. And what does the history show? <coughs> Look at the judgment in uh, demonetization. You have only one who, only one person who saw the silences of the constitution. A function which is supposed to be performed by RBI, the government function, exactly the same. How does government take over a function contrary to RBI Act? Look at the PMLA judgment on the right of bail. So where do you get? You had Justice Khanna who delivered dissenting judgment in uh, ABM Jabalpur. You had Justice Fazal Ali who told us due process 1950. I can give you <coughs> illustrations after illustrations. Two historical. Let me not create controversy amongst us. The two great instances from history. One from England, one from India, Maharashtra. Charles I, the king, Charles I king was tried for treason. How many of you know this? He questioned the authority of the court. He said, this court is constituted by me. How can you sit in judgment over me? The court said, no, sir. Even the king is not above the law. 
you are guilty of treason we will try you they tried him sentenced him to death death sentence executed on 30th january same day as gandhi ji was assassinated we had one illustration from maharashtra ram shastri he held the peshwa guilty of murder the peshwa who appointed him as a judge he held peshwa guilty of and then sentenced him so this all talk independence of the judiciary secured only through college you know i don't accept it looks attractive but often all that glitters is not gold when you go closer to the, then you come to know what you know, what is really gold and what is not now there are several other topics which i cannot even <coughs> briefly touch for me you want to introduce for example the issue about a community bona fide holds a particular practice as a part of its religion whether the courts have any role in that you go to sabrimala go to hisab go to several other practices whether lady should be permitted to enter dargah or shani temple or that lord in kerala matters of religion there also there is a lot of constitutional transformation or silences of the constitution that's one big topic as and when we meet again i will take it up second topic that <coughs> the powers of the president and powers of the governor silences of the constitution <laughs> one example i just gave you of gani jail singh sahab then the third topic which is the dissolution of the state assemblies the president upon a report or otherwise is satisfied that the government of the state cannot be carried on in accordance with the constitution in last 75 years we have had more than 125 cases of exercise of this power by this logic india should be in anarchy okay. therefore what is the constitutional transformation or silences of the constitution with regard to the exercise of this power then the proclamation of emergency and the citizens <coughs> liberty another point these are other several aspects of constitutional transformation and constitutional silences which if you permit and if i am not bored you it will be my pleasure to come back to you and yes, deal sir. with these fundamental topics thank you very much for being here thank you very much thank you very much speech very thought provoking provoking and constitutional debate you made it advanced we are all youngsters we want to learn so much things from uh, mahatma gandhi to the inland judgments and other things i mean you are not a bore i have been saying you are highly the third time you are enlightening further from and earlier also in the constitution the way this thing but given your valuable time and uh, I think very rich knowledge you have given to us. We are very grateful to you, sir. We will definitely will hear part two also, sir. Definitely will ask for your comment and other guys. Sometime in March, in March, in March, March. Yes, sir. Definitely after vacation, this. Please sir, take your auto. And I must sir. tell you, my juniors helped yeah. me a lot. Yes, uh, yes. They are there. Please stand up, stand up, stand up. Please stand up. Kindly yeah. introduce. Take your auto, sir. Yes, sir. attendance register or autograph here may put your autograph message next page only signature signature only signature signature sir thank you
anything else? Nothing, nothing. So, see, the message you can write it, sir. You feel whatever group and all. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Kindly join for a cup of tea. Those who are not receiving uh, WhatsApp messages, you must have written your name and kindly underline that so I can add next time so that it, your messages will be automatically in the canteen you can do that. <coughs> So you can cover. Yeah. One second. One second. My message. Message. It is a message from a respected senior. It is a very interesting interaction with fellow lawyers. Thank you. Thank you.